how psychedelics changed my thinking. Hello, Polymaths. Today I want to share a little bit about my personal journey towards homeostasis and neurostasis. Some of the biggest changes I've made in this life have occurred during microdosing and macrodosing experiences, and I can't express how valuable these tools have been for me. I'm now 33 years old. Over the past 13 years or so, I've only done four or five major macrodosing experiences, and I've only started doing microdosing uh, once or twice a year for a period of uh, two to three weeks. Uh, only in the past five years. Since then, I've been radically shifted in my priorities. My world is no longer compartmentalized. Some major changes have occurred in my life that I've always felt that I need to share, so here I am doing so. So around uh, the end of 2018, I began to vastly improve upon physical and mental disorders, or what I call disordered states, such as my OCD, or body-focused repetitive behavior, which I talk about in much more detail in this video here. This was certainly one of my most detrimental and embarrassing compulsions, and I feel for the 10% of the world's population that has to deal with it with some form of OCD or BFRB. And I really struggled to express the sheer relief that's felt from this personal narrative change, as well as this alleviation of the disorder. The things we tell ourselves about ourselves can be very often unconsciously developed and underexamined, and can subsequently be very harmful to us and other people. Now, it was around this time that I also began to address my speech disorder, which is exacerbated by something called Central Language Processing Disorder, as it was then known. Now it's known as uh, Auditory Processing Disorder, I believe, APD. Now, after another major psychedelic breakthrough that I had in 2016, in which I set aside uh, binge-watching Netflix and video gaming all day to pursue IDM and full-time music production, I pushed myself to work around this disorder and get at the roots underlying the issues that I have with receiving and interpreting auditory stimuli. I came to realize that the way that my APD works involves separating the audio layers between other layers, as well as interpreting the big picture, as in when it's appropriate to use certain sounds in certain sections, or how many bars of progression sound good within the context of the entire song. Now, it took a couple more years for me to realize that this was linked to what looks like autistic symptoms, recognizing when it's appropriate to use certain phrases, say certain things, or use certain volumes in certain contexts. This is a very common problem with those with autistic symptomology. The lack of social awareness and context within a social interaction has cost me many good conversations and likely a few good friendships over the years as well. Not to get on a tangent here, but the pressures of unexpected things coming up in conversation can often be overwhelming if we're not coming into the conversation prepared for that. We haven't been encouraged to, to use the kinds of speaking habits that we do and to, uh, to work on the speaking habits that we have. We have to be exposed to the different ways of thinking and interacting with the world to improve on them. Anyways, perhaps I should back up a bit to explain this auditory processing disordered state. From around 2008 to 2010, I didn't speak in anything but mumbles because of this lack of contextual awareness. I knew that I had a history of not speaking well, but no training on how to remedy this issue. So when I did actually muster the courage to speak, it would often be just in mumbles or completely incoherent. And somehow, I was okay with that. Now at this time, most of my friends assumed that I had this disorder going on and they didn't want to embarrass me by calling it out, so I stewed in this mode for years. Now this sounds like I'm blaming my friends for not telling me what, what's going on. I should be re resp responsible and recognize what's going on in my life, but that's kind of the problem. So we don't recognize when we're falling into these traps, these cognitive traps that are disjointed from reality in one way or another. Now the second time that I did DMT, I actually... Uh, hallucinated my own negative proclivities before my eyes in word form and watched them disintegrate, which was really trippy and very strange. But of course, it, it didn't actually like eliminate those proclivities, it just showed me what I needed to work on. And unfortunately, I didn't really have the tools available, available to me at that time or didn't know to seek those tools at that time to work on myself. I eventually just forced myself to start talking again because I couldn't function and I just began expecting to get into conversations and friendships with people and not have those friendships last. I kept expecting to hurt people with my words because I didn't know that I could do things differently. I didn't know that I could speak any differently or how to see things differently. Until around 2018 when I started writing essays and started uh, taking CBT classes and deeply examining my, myself and my capabilities. Yeah, 2018 was when I started taking cognitive behavioral therapy classes and combining that with microdosing. And that's when the real changes started happening. Now with this combination stretched out over months, the therapy techniques and the frameworks really started to begin to sink in. And suddenly I had lots of words to put to my problems. I had a very rich emotional vocabulary with which I could pinpoint the emotions that were affecting me and the affecting factors that were affecting my speech and affecting the way that I react to the world as opposed to responding, like using my ability to respond to responsibility. Not only that, but my vocabulary skyrocketed and I began to speak with much more precision. And suddenly, thanks to the upregulation of the serotonin 5H2A molecule, I had more regions of the brain communicating to each other and I was able to 
I guess access parts of my brain that I didn't have access or weren't as easily talking as they were before. I assume this took place in the Brokers and Wernicke's area, but as psychology and neuroscience shows, shows us, those areas aren't entirely responsible for the language. Those are not the language centers of the brain, and they're just highly involved in it. Anyways, I assume that there was much more conjunction going on there. Like, the way that I'm talking right now is because of this connection. I was not able to talk as fluidly or as smoothly as I currently am. It seems I was granted this sort of metacognition or third-person awareness of the situation that I didn't have previously. This radically changed how I approached my own vernacular and choices, as well as the values that I want to abide by and exemplify in every situation. Since these breakthroughs, I've had far more insights than previously, and now I get to kind of live as Neil deGrasse Tyson advises, is to learn something new every day and have your mind blown once a week. Now pretty much I'm having my mind blown once a day because I am actively learning classes. I'm actively taking a Listening to lectures, I'm always taking in information. So yes, I do feel that this has restored my childlike curiosity, and I no longer feel like a victim of the world. And now I can respond and participate in the world, and not be so affected by it. Going through all this has shown me just how malleable the human mind is, and how many disordered states we can easily fall into, how easily the average person can slip up. This has inspired me to resurrect my studies on the mind and existence. And since then, I have started to take in a lot more information. As I was saying, I would spend pretty much my whole day either listening to lectures from YouTube, or uh, courses from Coursera.com or Udemy or Brilliant.org or CuriosityStream. Any of these very easily accessible, very well curated educational entertainment platforms as well as just straight education from uh, lecture series that are from the most prestigious universities. So I get to listen to, to Yale stuff from Berkeley, Peterson and Verveke and Anderson Todd from University of Toronto. Just hours of just super top level philosophy, cutting edge psychology and cutting edge uh, neuroscience just from one of the, the some of the best universities in the world all for free right at your fingertips on i'm so grateful for the for these uh, capabilities and this free if not extremely cheap access to exactly what i want to learn in the format that i want to learn it available right now for you it's like i'm making a, a pitch for teaching yourself on the internet but yeah do that because now you can learn how you want to learn. I'm usually either listening on a mobile device in a pod in podcast format or listening to a lecture. I'll even watch lectures when I'm eating. I crave knowledge like I never have before now. And these notions of worthlessness or degrading self-narratives and harmful self-speak and all these self-destructive narratives that I once described to you, these are all completely eliminated, if not very much diminished. I now feel as if I have purpose. I spend most of my days studying psychology, neuroscience, philosophy, and phenomenology to try to derive the golden nuggets from all those fields and see how they apply to the most amount of people. I feel drawn towards altruistic, pragmatic goals and projects. Yeah, not out of some kind of like duty, just out of like natural compassion, and I assume that very much was influenced by the psychedelics. That's one of the most common things, is the feeling of love and connection we get from the oxytocin and serotonin upregulation. And also just from the, the love of the psychedelics or whatever you want to call it. <laughs> I mean, I'm very much healed. My, my Crohn's disease is, is managed much better than it ever has before. Uh, I'm readily drawn towards a better diet and more responsible uh, exercises and, and introspection, like just watching myself. I now have a hunger for knowledge and a restored drive for life, and I look forward to taking on challenges every day. Though, of course, I'm not perfect and I still have to take situations as they come, but I handle those situations as they arrive instead of succumbing to them. In fact, I now look forward to chances to improve myself, chances to, to put myself in uncomfortable situations, to build resilience and to build this, uh, what's called stress acclimation, and get my, my stress levels at exactly where they should be, not like too stressed and not understressed or understimulated to where I feel lackadaisical and depressed. I have initiative and purpose, and I think this is largely from studying the philosophers who have studied purpose and, and studying the meaning of existence and things like that. Um, the psychedelics definitely inspired interest in, in the deeper, deep thinks as well. These philosophers who have studied the true humanities and the true meaning of human existence and what it's like to live the best life and the most well-lived life. And I want to do that myself now. I have a drive to pursue that that best live life within the capacities of myself and the ability to, to push oneself on their capacities to understand their true abilities. I want to do that and I want to help other people do that as well. That's a big part of this channel. I've come to realize how much of this life is actually very much context dependent and because of that, once one comes to accept that, it can be extremely freeing. We don't know how to improve and live our best lives. And I wish I could say that psychedelics could provide this route for everyone. And it's not like it's provided all the answers for me, it's just very much opened up me. It's very much opened my mind to looking for the answers. So another major transformative experience that I encountered during psychedelic use was this notion of hearing all the sounds, hearing all the world sounds, um, sounds of joy and sounds of suffering. This can also be quite a common experience under psychedelic influences. 
and also just during deep meditative states where one is contemplating their place in the world and, and nature in general. The idea of a being that hears all the sounds of the world and all the goings on in the world, that dates back to Vietnamese Buddhism. In fact, in Vietnam, the god Avalokitesvara represents this very idea. Uh, in Chinese, it's known as Guan Ni Yin. Uh, Gua meaning contemplates deeply. Ni means the world, and Yin means all sound. So this is the god that contemplates deeply all of the world's sounds and uh, all of the sounds of suffering since the beginning of time. So what I gleaned from that particular psychedelic experience is that state kind of staying with me. Uh, this is back, when, I believe, when I was 26, when I restored my interest in music. Uh, essentially, this gave me this, this feeling of hearing like, I quite literally heard patterns in all of, of nature. The next day, I was hearing notes in the wind and the rustling of leaves. Like, I would hear the pitches of the, the leaf rustles and the pitch of the wind, and my brain would begin constructing harmonies with that. And I knew that this was just side effects from the psychedelic use the night before. But what this revealed to me is that this is a state I can be in all the time. And indeed, that notion of the world's sounds and all that's going on around the world, that did indeed stick with me. It's obviously not like, like present all the time, that would be overwhelming, but I can now call upon that state of mind and put myself into that state of mind. This has eradicated feelings of groupthink and set me into a place where I seek relation constantly. Compassion and empathy are a consistent mindset for me. Now, it doesn't mean that this state of mind was set in instantly. That is the mindset. It doesn't mean I'm constantly acting on that mindset. But that is the perspective that I take on all the time now, yes. Because through my experiences, I've not only heard the sounds of all the world's suffering, I've also researched it. Philosophy, sociology, neurology, and psychology, all these fields have shown me just how easily manipulated we can be, how little control our, we have over our own fate. That is, until we are shown the control and capacity that we have for expanding on that control that we really have. Now, psychedelics have also made me more in touch with myself and my senses. Recent studies have shown that people can now consciously activate what was thought to be a sympathetic response to stimuli. This is known as positively valence paresthesia, or frisson in French, or just goosebumps. Well, this is supposed to be something that was thought to be brought on only externally by a powerful movie or song. But apparently people can activate this sensation consciously. And since I did psychedelics, I have been able to do so. And I shall now demonstrate. And then it goes away. So I now go through every day with rich, enveloping, emotional connection with the state of all living beings, and actively seek to relate to all organic forms in all places at all times. Well, perhaps not all the time, but this state is very, very prevalent in my life now. Now this can take place via what Verbeke calls relevance realization, or salience landscaping. That is, expanding the landscape of what is most salient to you, or what sticks out to you. Contemplation and reflection on the similarities in patterns and cellular structures as well as skeletal structures and plants and, and animals. All the relevance that's made so prevalent during psychedelic trips can be continued into our sober lives, often for months at a time. And I believe with practice and at least getting to know yourself and how you have been personally affected by the psychedelic can continue this going on for your life, for the rest of your life. And uh, at least that's been the case for me. Like the psychedelics have revealed what I should stay interested in to remain interested in my life. And I'm now working towards those fields and putting together videos like this. This is a big part of, of sustaining my childhood like curiosity and my, my interest in life, I believe. Again, the landscape of what is most salient to me has been expanded by the psychedelics and by my study, by my ability to zoom in and zoom out, to extrapolate and abstract upon the world. Simply put, the contents of the world are now more interesting to me. Infinite love and compassion is a common effect from psychedelic use, but once one returns to the harrowing struggles of regular sober life, our old thought patterns and paradigms can return. This is why we must remember that psychedelics are not a quick fix. They're tools to remind us what we need to have worked on. Now, I should state that I realize the stigma underlying the use of these substances, and the risk that I run by discussing the use of these substances if I want to be taken seriously as a cognitive behavioral therapy practitioner. That said, I believe this message is very important, and the field of integrated psychedelic therapy is growing very rapidly. Ideally, the stigma surrounding these substances will begin to dissipate over the years as the FDA puts these into stage 3 clinical trials. I digress. Of course, I want to emphasize that those with schizophrenia and those with prior conditions should not even consider this stuff. Opening your mind to that degree and making yourself very vulnerable when your mind is already and endogenously very vulnerable, that can be very dangerous. And any little bit of research that you do will tell you this. Yeah, and any, anyone with predispositions to self-harm should definitely not be taking these things. I'm gonna read this straight from the script because I don't wanna get this part wrong. Whenever I talk about this with my friends that are experienced in psychedelic use and are interested in self-improvement, I usually advise this method. However, accidentally, I may have stumbled upon it. There are psychedelic therapy lessons one can take online as well, but the main idea is to microdose for three days on, four days off, or vice versa. 
Now, Paul Stamos recommends five days on and two days off, um, but that's not worked as well for me. Whatever you do, though, try to consume healthy content and expose yourself to positive environments. Take CBT, ACT, and RB, RABT courses, or whatever courses that will help you improve on what you want to improve on. If it's healthy communications classes, then do it. Like, don't hold yourself back, because these are the little like sections of hours, like the four to six hours, where if you do this thing, you're going to be radically changed in the future. Even if you do this sober, like these are the moments where you have to crack down, you have to make yourself a little bit uncomfortable, and do the thing that you don't want to do as much as doing the thing that's instant dopamine releasing for these extended periods where you have to let it sink in. And uh, I talk about other techniques of helping these things sink in on the channel as well, taking breaks and coming back to things using the um, Yoga Nidra or the NSDR, as Huberman talks about, non sleep deep rest and other tools that can help you memorize and absorb information quickly and integrate it into your life and your behaviors. Um, but yeah, we'll talk about that more on the channel as well. Yeah, whatever it is you want to do, if you want to become a better computer scientist or engineer, then microdose while you're learning during that time. This is literally what Silicon Valley is doing right now, that's why that is booming. There are lots of people that are using psilocybin and uh, microdosing L LSD to get this kind of like extra a uh, little bit wider perspective on things to be able to see the whole, which is extremely useful for with designing computers. Of course, that's like a great thing to go to for that. Um, and designing uh, software, the lessons that we learn stick easier because we're in a more receptive state. And this brings me to my final point, the idea of mindset and setting, which I'm sure you've heard about if you've done psychedelics, the crucial importance of set and setting to the trip. Well, I want to tell you, <laughs> this is one of the most important things I've learned, that is always going on. We are always in a state of being influenced by the world. We are we should always be taking account of our mindset and the settings that we're exposing ourselves to because they, the settings are influencing us. We're always in a state of being affected by the world because of combinatorial explosion. It is simply too much for the brain to take in to consider every situation and consider how every situation is affecting us because that would cause information overload. So we settle. We settle based on what we're exposed to thinking is the healthy things to be doing or like just healthy enough to get by but we don't think about it that way either we just kind of like that's the settling place that we come to most naturally is uh, what society tells us is enough for us to get by living, living healthy but mostly succumbing to our influences we really fool ourselves into thinking that we have perfect control over our lives what we do have control over is what we expose ourselves to our friends and our family our ecological system whatever we can control within that we need to take advantage of. So let's be mindful of where our path is taking us in this life. Heraclitus had it right with the zones of control. You have zones that you cannot control, things that are beyond your control, and zones that you can't control. And what we have available to us, the resources that we have available to us to change our environment as well as change ourselves, we should be taking advantage of. But we're not taught that in school, so we're just like left doing our own thing in the, the having mode and trying to pursue whatever seems like the most satisfying thing to pursue, which is usually superficial temporary means of acquisition and superficial means of fulfillment, which is no bueno because it leaves us unsubstantiated and leaves us unfulfilled. It's not a good place to be. So I just want to say, if you choose to use these tools, treat them as such. They are not toys. They are definitely tools and they are to be taken seriously. Anyways, I really appreciate you watching this video through, and tune in next week for more ways to live your best life in this modern age. Wow, thanks so much for making it to the end of the video. If you've made it to the end of this video, that means that you're one of the greatest living humans on the planet today. And you should celebrate that fact by subscribing to the channel. And leave a comment to show how this video has affected you, and perhaps share it with your friends that you think would be impacted greatly. You can also subscribe to my Facebook and Twitter if you're into that kind of thing. All of my current books and essays are open to the public on my WordPress website, and you can reach that in the description below. I want to thank you again so much for watching this video, and if you feel like donating, you can do that at my Patreon here. Public donations are the only way that programs like these stay afloat in today's extremely competitive times. Anyways, thanks so much for watching Polymaths. I'll see you in the next one.